that the majority of solar power systems are set up. There's also off-grid solar power systems and combinations thereof. But most systems that we install are grid-tied solar power systems. And what you have is the sun shines sunlight on solar panels, which are on your roof. And the power outputted from the solar panels goes into an inverter, which converts the DC power from the solar panels to AC and synchronizes it with your grid. And it connects to your distribution panel like any other appliance with the one difference that it is delivering power to your home, whereas most appliances consume power. So when the sun is shining, um, the solar power system delivers power to your home and you get first dibs on that power. If there isn't enough solar power to power your home at that particular time, then your utility will make up the difference. If you are getting more solar power coming in than you are using at any given time, then the system will back feed your two-way meter, which MB Power will install, and you will send power onto the grid, and you will bank that energy as energy credit. Um, that's quite generous of the power company, except for two caveats. One would be that they charge HST on the value of energy that you share with them. And the other one is that if you have a positive balance on March the 30th, they will take that positive balance and not give you any credit for it. With the typical system, you are not going to have a balance on March the 30th because you have just come out of the he heating season and um, there is minimal solar in the winter time. So you will have used up all your credits probably in February, hopefully by the end of March. If not, I suggest you turn up your heat a few degrees. Um, and then you will head back into the new summer season, the new solar season at zero and um, you can bank credits through the summer depending on the capacity of your solar array and the amount of energy that you consume. Your power bill, as it's called, is really an energy bill because they charge you for the energy that you use. And there is a certain amount of confusion about energy and power. Power is the rate at which work is accomplished. So we're making a lot of heat and smoke right here with this, these two back wheels. There's a lot of power being used up. Energy is the potential to do work. So the more full the gas tank is, the more energy it contains and the more, power, the more work that can be done. Um, so your power bill measures kilowatt hours and kilowatt hours are like gas in your gas tank. It's a certain amount of energy. How fast that energy gets used up depends on your household. Of course, there are often two solutions to this one problem. Um, whatever that problem is. So energy efficiency is also important. But the business that I'm in isn't so much energy efficiency, it's installing solar panels. Um, so this is a readout from an energy monitoring system from a solar array. And it tells you in what hours, what every solar panel has delivered so far that day and energy so far that day in kilowatt hours, uh, month and lifetime. So as you can see, um, the amount of power that you get from a solar array isn't consistent all the time. It's always varying depending. 
Sometimes it's a cloudy, sunny day. So you get this kind of thing. These are almost perfect days here. And it peaks. So supposing your house base load was approximately whatever this line represents, say it's a, a thousand watts, then you would be exporting power through the middle of the day. And then you would start importing power towards the end of the day and all night. The tilt angle and the uh, orientation of your roof is also important for solar power systems because the sun changes its path through the summer and the winter. So if you have a steep roof, you'll get more energy during the winter time. And if you have a flatter roof, you'll get more energy through the summertime. Um, the flatter the roof, the less important the orientation with respect to south is. And the flatter your roof, the more your energy production will be skewed towards the summertime. So I thought this was a fairly neat illustration of how that works. Um, it basically tells you the relative energy yield for different tilt angles. So the ideal would be 45 degrees due south. If you have a very, very slight tilt angle, then you're going to sacrifice 25% of what you could get um, because you have a very slight angle on your roof. If you put them on the very south face of your wall, then you would be sacrificing um, about 15% and your energy yield would be heavily skewed to the winter time. And then if you're facing southeast, you can see the amounts that you would get relative to the perfect amount. And if you're facing due east, um, you can also tell that if you're facing due east it's, uh, or due west, then you take a significant hit in the amount of energy that you can get. So it's important that your roof face south. There's the moral of that story. Um, we're fairly well positioned in New Brunswick uh, for solar. Um, New Brunswick Southeast is almost as good as most places in the country, except for the south of, region of uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta, where they have cold, dry, clear day after day in the wintertime. Um, on a month-to-month uh, -month basis, um, people ask about snow load. There will be times when the snow will cover your roof and your output will be severely or completely diminished. And that's just a fact of living in the Maritimes. Luckily, during the winter is not our high production time anyway and snow load can be mitigated by the pitch of the roof. Um, and I do not recommend that people go off and shovel off their solar panels, although I have had people that did that. So somebody calls me up and says, I live at, um, say, um, 25 North Street, right here, this red, this red um, building. So I can go on Google Earth, I can look up the building, I can measure the roof, I can get a very good idea of the orientation of the roof because straight down is south, and I can put together a quote. And that's how I put together most of my quotes these days, is through satellite images. And if you're interested in proceeding, then oftentimes I'll come and have a look personally at the roof. But this makes the job of site assessment much more quick and easy. Um, solar panels are made primarily of silicon, which is the same stuff that we've been making solar panels out of since the late 50s when we started putting them on satellites. And the technology has not fundamentally changed since then, 
although we have been increasing efficiency incrementally, but there's not going to be a quantum leap in the efficiency of solar panels with the silicon solar cell. Um, we would have to really come up with another formula and um, use a different physics, or maybe some genius will rewrite the physics of solar, but I don't think that's going to happen. But the silicon solar panel has proved to be very reliable in the long term, relatively inexpensive to manufacture. And in my opinion, the best thing about it is that it is primarily made of glass and aluminum, both of which are completely recyclable. Um, I did speak about recyclability. Most solar panels are guaranteed. They carry a power performance guarantee of 25 years. So they are guaranteed not to degrade less than 12% roughly, it varies a little from manufacturer to manufacturer in 25 years. And I have found that that has held out so far in the amount of time I've been so installing solar, which is not yet 25 years, um, but that has proven out quite well. Although I have had to replace a few solar panels. Just a note on PV pricing, um, it, since 1980, it has come down amazingly. I think that this graph only goes to about 2000. Um, I guess this is 2000, so it goes up to 20, I don't know what, but the, the volume goes up and the price has been coming down and that has been continuing to happen, although it's really flattened off in the last while but also with the bulk purchase, if I can bring up the volume that I bring into New Brunswick, then I can also help bring the price down. This is a 60 module solar array in Fredericton. And this is the array that the graphs um, and the data that I have referred to previously has come from. That system has an inverter behind every solar panel rather than having a central inverter like in the illustrations. Um, the industry has been moving more and more to having micro inverters and there's one inverter behind every solar panel or every two solar panels depending on the system. So we have our micro inverters on rail, aluminum rail, all stainless steel hardware, which is lag bolted to the rafters under the roof. And then there's aluminum flashing tucked up under the asphalt shingles. So with this system, the uh, mounting system is going to far outlast the roof. And also people ask about uh, the longevity and how they're going to replace the roof if they put solar panels on their home. Two things degrade asphalt roofs, UV radiation and heat. And if your roof is covered with solar panels, then you are protecting it from both of those. So the roof will still wear out eventually, but it will last several times longer than the roof that is not protected from UV radiation and heat. And the industry isn't old enough yet to deal with having to replace roofs that have solar arrays on them. So this is kind of a big picture of the rail, all of, this, all of the uh, inverters, junction boxes again flashed into the roof and we're starting to put the solar panels. Um, most systems now come with monitoring and the microinverter will upload information to a communication device, which will translate that information to the internet and some server somewhere will be storing your data and you will have an account where you can access it 
or some of these devices store the data and then you can activate a local area network through Wi-Fi and you can pick up the device as a Wi-Fi signal on your iPhone or Android device or whatever Wi-Fi device you have and you can access the logged data off of uh, that uh, medium. Not all systems are installed on a roof. This one has been ground mounted and we have 16 solar panels. These are bifacial modules, which are the big new thing that several manufacturers came out with a few years ago. Bifacial modules will absorb uh, sunlight from either the front of the solar module and the back and my customer is trying to optimize the amount of energy he gets from both sides of the solar array, which is why he mounted all the microinverters uh, over here vertically to minimize the shading. The jury is still out on how well bifacial actually works. Personally, I don't think in most installations, including this one, it's worth the extra legwork that you would go through and the extra cost. This is a system right on the end of the High Marsh Road. It's a central inverter system connected to series strings of solar panels. People ask me what will happen when the power goes out. Most grid tie systems shut down immediately when the power goes out, but there are some systems uh, we install where the customer wants to have a backup. So we put in a bunch of batteries and an inverter that can disconnect part of the home from the power grid and power that part of the home. Usually the essential things, lights, water, and refrigeration off of a battery bank. Battery banks and this type of inverter are quite expensive. It uh, nearly doubles the cost of an installation often. Um, then there's totally off-grid systems, which are similar. You have a solar array, which goes to a charge controller, which charges the battery. And then you have an inverter, which takes that battery voltage and converts it to 120 volts AC to power your AC loads. And um, there's a lot of cottagers out there who have off-grid systems. This is a nice example of one. Charge controller, inverter, battery ve ventilation for the battery box. And uh, this is a, a central inverter system and the inverters are installed in a garage. And that's about it for my presentation. Are there any questions? So we had a couple questions in the chat. Um, so the slide you have where you're showing the different roof angles. Yes. Um, Linda was wondering, because you talked about um, the side on the east, and she was wondering if that was true east or magnetic east. Well, the, the two are about 15 degrees apart. So for the purposes of solar, um, it's going to make two or three percent of difference and for the purposes of that uh, graphic um, we're not going to differentiate um, magnetic north or magnetic south from geographical south. Does that answer your question? Linda? I think so. 
Uh, let's see. I think so, yeah. Um, okay, Rick had a question. Oh, two questions. Um, cool. So his first question, the um, slide you have where you're, or you have a couple slides that are showing the 60 panels in Fredericton. Yes. Um, he was wondering what percentage of household power requirements that array provides. And he was also wondering how much it cost. A system like this would make most households net zero or even smaller than this. Um, if you have a well insulated, efficient home heated with heat pumps, then you can be net zero for about 30 or 40 solar panels. And that will cost uh, about 25 to $30,000 taxes in, I would say. And feel free guys, if, if you have other follow-up questions um, to unmute yourselves and, and ask Woody, that's totally cool too. Um, so the next question we have, so this is the second question from Rick. He's wondering if Tesla batteries are less expensive than um, the NECAD ones shown. I think the, the red um, ones. Those red ones are lead acid batteries, proudly made in Spring Hill. Um, and the Tesla battery, I have looked at it and it's much more expensive than um, lead acid battery although it does have certain advantages. I would say the jury is still out on whether they live up to their guaranteed lifetime. Um, but one major advantage of the Tesla battery, which is a lithium ion battery, and this is an advantage of all lithium ion batteries, is that you can discharge them to a very deep level and leave them in that discharge state for a period of time and recharge them with little to no loss of efficiency. With lead acid batteries, if you discharge them and give them a deep discharge and leave them for a week, you will not have the same battery. It will be, the capacity will be reduced permanently. Great. Um, Peter? was wondering, is electrical de-icing slash snow melting a strategy that could be used in the winter? That strategy could be used in the winter and I have seen engineer drawings of that type of thing, but you are going to use a lot of power to melt off those solar panels and will you get more power Will it be more of an advantage um, if you melt them one day and then it snows the next day and then you melt them again and then it snows the next day? Um, I can imagine it not working out very well. Luckily, solar panels are only about 20% efficient. So 80% of the sunlight coming in, except for what's reflected, ends up as heat in the solar panels and that heat will melt the snow. So if some of the array gets uncovered uh, and it's a sunny day, then they tend to melt themselves off naturally uh, quite effectively. Great. Um, Richard was wondering, is there an additional monthly meter charge from NB Power um, meter the solar power to the homeowner? There isn't. He had a second question. Uh, he said, if you were to cover a carport with panels using the panels as the roof, will the setup be able to shed water without leaking? The short answer is yes. But um, I have never done this. I know it would work. You may have the occasional leak. If it's a carport, it's not going to destroy your grandmother's oak table. Um, 
And also, I believe that leaks would be quite easy to fix because uh, as I imagine it, and I haven't seen this done, but I've considered doing it, I still want to do it um, on some project, is um, it would be silicon caulking or some kind of higher quality caulking than that that would go between the solar panels and if there was a leak then you could just squeeze a bit more caulking in there and probably have a permanent solution so i would say yes build your carport use the solar panels for a roof two birds with one stone a little bit of light will come in from between the cells and give you a little bit of light in there just naturally when the sun is shining i think it would be a beautiful project the electrical inspectors might spend a long time looking at it, but I'm sure that uh, all of the issues that they have could be overcome. That sounds great. Yeah. All right. Um, Linda has another question. She's wondering about how far away do trees have to be to have an effect on the panels or to not have an effect, I think. Kind of a rule of thumb is that the difference in height of the tree between the bottom of the solar panels and the tree. Um, remember the solar panels are on your roof so they're already isolated. But the rule is about two to one. So if the tree is towering above your solar panels by 20 feet, then it should be at least 40 feet away. And that doesn't mean that the tree is 20 feet high. If your solar panels are already 20 feet high, then we're talking about a 40 foot tree would have to be about 40 feet um, away because it's only projecting above the solar array by 20 feet. So the ratio is two to one. Um, so I hope that that's clear. It's kind of hard to convey the math without a picture. If you want to draw one super quick, you can. Uh... <laughs> okay. Let's see here. I don't know how's this working. I think a bit up. Yep. I don't know just what you guys can see because I've got a picture of uh, a house with solar panels on it on my screen. But... I think I think that's good. Anyone can chime in if uh, you know. But I think that I think that's good. Okay. So Andrew. McFarlane wanted to know, are there any advantages to have a non-roof mounted array? Yes. The advantage is that you can remove the snow from the solar panels with a long handled broom. Um, that's the primary advantage. Another advantage is that you evade any issues with having to re-roof your roof with solar panels being on the roof. And there are certain uh, worries from uh, uh, public safety people that the solar array could interfere with uh, um, emergency personnel if they have to get on your roof for some reason. So that would be, I, I would say, a distant third advantage to having a ground mounted solar array. Would you say that those concerns are valid or, you know, concerning the emergency crews on your roof? Um, no, not anymore because the microinverters 
have so many layers of protection, they won't, they will shut down if they don't see grid power. They will shut down if they detect an arc and they have technology available to detect an arc in the wiring or a ground fault in the wiring. And also microinverters isolate every single solar panel. And each solar panel outputs about 30 to 40 volts and it's current limited because it can only deliver the amount of power that it can convert from sunlight. So nobody is going to be injured from the DC power coming from a single solar panel. Um, so the, the safety level on microinverter systems is extremely high. When you have 10 or 12 solar panels wired in series connected to a central inverter, then the story is different. And I could imagine on a sunny day, if emergency personnel have to cut a hole in the roof and they have to deal with solar panels and the output wiring on um, that would be a concern. But with microinverters where every solar panel is isolated individually, it's not a concern. Great. Um, we have a couple other questions about ground mounted arrays. So Rick was wondering for a ground mounted array, how far away from the house can they be? Several hundred meters question mark. Yes, they can be several hundred meters away from the array. The Distance, of course, will just cost more because you will have more cable and you may have to increase the wire size in the cable to compensate for line loss. But beyond that, there is no limit. So you were just talking about, I'm skipping around a little bit, but I will get to everybody's question, I promise. Because you were just talking about micro inverters versus a central inverter, um, some people were wondering about the cost difference between micro and central inverters, if, if there's a cost difference. Um, there used to be more of a cost dis difference, but the Chinese have jumped on the micro inverter market and also volume has increased greatly. So the price of microinverters has come down significantly. At this point, they're, they're about on par between microinverters and uh, central inverters. Great. Um, so in terms of mounting the panels on the ground, uh, Rick was wondering if the hardware for mounting them on the ground adds a lot of cost, adds a lot to the overall cost. And the answer would be yes. There is significant additional cost in mounting a uh, solar array on the ground versus mounting it on your roof. Um, this system in this picture is about 16, it is 16 solar panels. And the pole mount itself, I can't remember if it was eight, I want to say $8,000, it was somewhere around there just for the galvanized steel hardware. That doesn't include the concrete, the excavation, and there's quite a bit of assembly involved with it as well. Perfect. We have some NB power questions. Yep. So, um, Someone's wondering, for the typical residential installation, how long from approval to completed installation, including NB power inspection? Um, I would say be prepared to give it six weeks, although it doesn't need to be that long. It could be about uh, a week or two, but um, what I try to do is couple up, bunch up uh, two or three projects together so that the inspectors can come down and, ins and inspect several projects. It makes them a lot happier and a happy inspector is much 
easier to deal with than uh, an inspector that feels like you could make his life easier, but you just didn't. Okay. Um, someone else is wondering, oh, Chad is wondering, is it a one-to-one -one credit from NB Power if uploading excess energy to the grid? It's a one-to-one -one credit. Lovely. All right. Um, Linda's wondering if she has several peaks, can they be split? I assume she means solar panels be split between the peaks on the south facing slope. Solar panels can be fit in between objects on the roof. Um, I don't, I don't know exactly how to answer the question beyond that. I think perhaps if you have more than one roof surface, if you can put, if they all have to be together or if you can put them on different parts, I think is maybe the question, but Linda, you can correct me if I'm wrong. They can be scattered about on the roof, but the cost goes up a lot when you do that. Good. Um, Richard's wondering, does Enphase deliver AC or DC power? And does this have to be inverted when sent to NB power? Um, the solar panels deliver DC power, which has to be inverted to connect it to the power grid. So the solar panels deliver DC power and then it goes through an inverter or that could be end phase or AP systems or Fronius or there's a bunch of them out there converted to AC and synchronized with grid power. And then the power is consumed by the home and any excess that's not consumed by the home back feeds the grid. Great. There's just one. Oh, no, we have more. No worries. Um, so Richard was also wondering, could you speak to using PV, take in association with an EV vehicle, electric vehicle? Um, well, they would match quite well. Um, you would be further ahead if you could avoid having to share power with NB Power. So if you could somehow have your EV programmed to charge, or maybe you would just manually plug it in when you have solar power available and then disconnect it or stop the charging process when there isn't solar power available, um, that would work quite well because that energy would be basically invisible to the power company and they wouldn't be able to charge you HST on it. I can imagine a world where microprocessors take care of all this for us. So you tell your EV that you want to be, have a full charge by Tuesday morning at nine o'clock. It's Sunday night, uh, Monday, cloudy. Your EV says, no, 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 no. Well, your microprocessor, I don't know if it'd be your EV or what, but anyway, would, no, not enough, not enough. Uh, Tuesday or um, and then by say three o'clock in the afternoon on Monday the sun comes out blue sky so the EV says okay time to charge so it starts charging but that is technology that I have not seen yet you would have to do that manually um, if you just plug in your EV whenever you get home and put it in the garage or put it in your yard then it may not be a great uh, match with solar because you get home at four o'clock at night, you plug in your EV, it's all charged by midnight, and then in the daytime, you're exporting all this power that could be charging your EV. Gotcha. Yeah, I know some people that I think hook up their cars, their electric vehicles to their homes, but I'm not sure exactly how they do it. So. Um, we want a clarification on 
power outages when you have solar panels. So Richard says, is it true that your PV power will not be available to the homeowner during powder, power outages? I know it depends um, on what system you have, but I'll let Woody take that. In general, that is correct. The system is designed to shut down during a power outage to protect any service personnel who may be trying to repair the power, the uh, electrical system. Um, but as I said in the presentation, there are other ways of setting it up where you can integrate it with the battery bank that will disconnect the system from the grid and continue to power some loads in your home during a power outage. You can also add uh, a, a backup system later on. So you may install a system, a grid tied system, and then in five years decide that you want to add a battery backup system. And it's not that hard to do. The big manufacturers out there know that this happens and they are ready to accommodate that need or that desire by people. So they're are and there will be more um, battery backup systems that work in conjunction with a grid tied solar power system to take advantage of the grid tied solar power if the power goes out. That's great. I have a question, and I see just another question came in. Um, you said you've had to replace some panels in the past. Um, are there, is it for different reasons or like what's the most common or? I don't know the reason, um, but I stopped using that manufacturer of solar panels, but um, oh. they just started to uh, drop a bit in efficiency. And I don't know, I can't correlate that with anything. It's just seemed to be a random thing. Maybe it was on the production line. There was something not quite right. I have no idea why, but, but the M phase monitoring system, um, we noticed that some of the microinverters were not putting out the power that they were. So we isolated it to a solar panel. So you could see like exactly which solar panel wasn't performing. Yes, we could. Okay, cool. Um, Andrew was wondering, and I don't know if you know this, but he said when you're buying a new home, you're able to add certain portion to your mortgage for repairs slash renovations. Do you know if you could spend that money on a solar install? Um, I'm quite sure that uh, it would fit if you can add something to your mortgage for renovation, then I'm sure that you could use those funds for a solar installation because that is a renovation. It's a capital asset that is part of your home that adds to the overall value of your home. So I would call that a renovation. That makes sense. Um, the other thing I'll say is that NB Power does have a total home energy efficiency program, I believe it's called, and um, how it works is you pay money, like $99 to have an energy advisor come, they'll assess your home and um, tell you the different things you could do to make it more energy efficient, and I think um, that some of those things would include solar panels and they might have a rebate for that, do you know if that's right, Woody, or? That is correct. They do have a rebate, but there is a, it's a long journey. So um, mm. some of my customers have tried to go that route and they have the energy assessment and then they have to add R10 or R20 to their walls, which is quite a long expense. It's a lot of red tape and then it has to be reassessed by an energy assessor and perhaps windows have to be upgraded. And it can be a long list with a long run of red tape before you get your, I think it's 30 cents per watt back on the cost of uh, the solar power installation. 
That's good to know because yeah. I hadn't heard of anyone who had who had done it, but that's good to know that it's you know maybe a lengthy process and might not be worth it. Um, right now, I'm going to go over how the bulk purchasing program works because we have a question about that, and I think it'd be good to go over it. And Woody, you can um, correct me or add more details at the end. So. Um, the way that it works and how EOS has done it in the past is we have an information session like this where we sort of give general info um, and then folks who are looking to put solar on their home get a site assessment from Woody to see if, if they're eligible. And then once we have enough people signed up so that the number of solar panels ordered um, is like, because we have a, a minimum amount that needs to be ordered for the bulk purchase price to, to be applied. Once that number is reached, um, the panels will be ordered and, and Woody can start um, doing installs. Um, I was going to say something else about that, but I don't remember. Um, yeah. And it and oh so the the day the deadline to sign up for that is August thirty first. Um, so if you can get a quote by Woody or have a site assessment done by Woody by that time, um, you you qualify for the bulk purchase price. Um, we have extended that deadline in the past because of um, more folks are interested or or things like that or maybe there's um a delay or two but generally that's how it's worked in the past am i forgetting something or woody i can't think of anything that else that you're forgetting okay uh, cover the basic outline of the program and okay. the deadline okay uh, yeah. does anyone have any further questions you can feel free to put them in the chat box or to turn your mic on Oh, I have a question. It's not my question, but someone asked me today. Um, they basically said, and I, and I don't know that you can answer it for sure, but they just said like, hey, my power bill is like $200 a month. Um, what would installing solar do for that? Um, the first thing I would look at would be the roof. How much uh, how many solar panels can I put on the roof? And if they have a 200 amp electrical entrance, then I can put um, up to about 38 solar panels on that roof if I can fit them on it. And I can generate a energy yield estimate with software online. And I can send that number to the customer and say, this will generate a certain number of kilowatt hours and this is how much it's going to save you. Um, and they will decide whether it's worth it or not for them to do it. So I need to have specific numbers to work from. And I, I am not proficient enough with billing that I can convert from $200 a month to a certain number of solar panels. But also that is kind of irrelevant because it depends on the orientation and size of the roof anyway. So I generally make that my starting point. That makes sense. Um, so we have a question about uh, commitment after you get an assessment done and if there is a cost to do the assessment. Um, I'm gonna say no, there's no cost to the assessment. Generally, I can do it off of Google Maps which is far quicker um, than getting in a car and going driving somewhere and measuring the roof. So I, I don't mind doing it off of Google Maps and then occasionally um, there will be something that's unclear and then I'll go to a customer's home and, and we'll figure out um, what's going on or maybe there's something that needs to be moved or I'll see something on the roof and it'll just be a different patch of roof rather than a 
skylight or something like that. So sometimes there's clarification that needs to be happening, but I can do almost everything remotely at this point. For sure, sounds great. Um, wondering if you've done any installs in Irish Town or True Dame area. I feel like you've probably done installs in mo most areas, eh? Yeah, I did one in Irish Town. Um, it was grid tie with battery backup on a new bungalow that a uh, young man was building there. There we go. Yeah, I don't remember exactly where it was. Seems to me I kind of went north from the place, the shell station on the end of the Caledonia Industrial Park and went in there somewhere. <laughs> All good. All right, well, unless there's any more questions, and I'll wait a minute. Um, this has been a great webinar and there's been a lot of great questions. Thank you guys so much for coming. Um, if you think of anything afterwards, you can feel free to send me an email. And uh, please do let me know if, if you'd like me to, to give your information to Woody. I'm gonna send it all um, in one big email so that Woody has everybody's name and address. So if you're interested, you can send me your name and your address and I will send it on to Woody. And Richard was wondering if he can send you his plans for a carport. And I feel like the answer is yes. Yeah, I look forward to seeing, if you want to do that, I look forward to seeing your plans for it. I've got Perfect. another for, uh, in Bakhtush who's building a carport and they want solar panels on it. I just didn't have the chutzpah to suggest using the solar array as the roof. Um, but if you come to me with that idea, I say, let's go for it as far as you want to. Sounds like that'll be magic. All right, guys, thanks so much and uh, have a great evening. Thank you all for coming out Vir virtually. That's right. <laughs>